if you're an investor, you need to practice the academy of control every single day. And that's what you do. Because what's up to me is my process. Learning, trying to get better, doing a good research, executing a good process. After I bought the stock or when I own the stock, so many good things and bad things can happen. None of those things are up to me. By the way, bad things will happen. And when bad things happen, me reacting rationally is up to me. So Vitaly has written several books and penned many articles. So you could say he loves writing about investing, but also loves other topics like family, fatherhood, stoicism, and classical music. Today, we will focus primarily on his newest book, Soul in the Game. So I think the concept of Soul in the Game is very powerful, and it extends far outside the realm of investing. So for listeners who haven't yet read your book, can you discuss how you define Soul in the Game? Sure. Um, so Soul in the Game is really just, if one word can actually describe it very well, alignment. So let's start this kind of a basic layer of selling a game is a skin in a game, okay? And think of a professional, uh, of a, I'll give you a couple examples. Let's say a cook, you would expect that cook to eat his own, you know, his own cooking, right? That cook has skin in a game. He doesn't just benefit from selling his food to his patrons, but also if he sells poisonous food to his patrons, he'll, you know, he, he'll bear the, uh, the consequences. I guess probably one of the most if you, I'm going to ask a listener and viewer to visualize this. Imagine you're an engineer building a bridge, and then when the first truck rolls over the, you know, you know, through the bridge, you are standing under the bridge. That means having skin in the game. So in other words, not just benefiting from the upside, but also suffering the consequences of the down of the downside of your creation. So that's skin in the game. Okay, so in the game is the next iteration of that. And that iteration where that there is, you have this inner alignment with whatever you're doing. It's something it's so dear to you, it's so important to you that your sole focus is to be doing a great job. Is a, like, um, we've seen people that have soul in a game. I'll give you an example. You go to a restaurant and you have this waiter or waitress that gives just absolutely incredible service. And that person is not really doing it because how much you know she's going to get tipped or he's going to get tipped, but does it because they want to make you feel good. Or you go to a mechanic and you know that like they will, that mechanic will do whatever he has to to make sure he does a good job for you because he cares about delivering value to you as a customer. So what you find, usually people that have soul in the game, first of all, their identity is perfectly aligned with what they're doing. In other words, if they do something that would diminish uh, something that would diminish what they're doing, it actually would uh, go against their identity. Now that's point number one. Point number two, they're usually playing an infinite game. And what I mean by this is that this car mechanic, he like you know like when you, when you, when, you, when when we go to car mechanic, there's usually a symmetry of information, right? You, the mechanic knows so much more about your car than you do. Okay, so the reason we usually don't like going to car mechanics is because we're always afraid to be ripped off. So when you go to car mechanic and says, you know what, your brakes, you can still use them for another year or two. Well, that car mechanic knows so much more about the, those brakes than you do. And that person being honest with you creates a connection to that person. And therefore, in the long run, it's going to pay off. So anyway, this is just an example. But that's what, to me, that means having soul in the game. This alignment, that inner alignment you have with whatever you're doing. Yeah, I really like that, that uh, definition. And obviously, like you said, with skin in the game, I mean, you can have skin in the game, but obviously not have soul in the game, right? Like, like you said, if, if you were an engineer making that bridge and you hated your job of engineering, well, yeah, you'd still have skin in the game if you're standing underneath that bridge, but you might not actually enjoy what you're doing. That's right. So you wrote about Jiro Ono, the three Michelin star sushi chef featured on the documentary Jiro Dreams of Sushi. So he said, quote, once you decide on your occupation, you must immerse yourself in your work. You have to fall in love with your work. Never complain about your job. You must dedicate your life to mastering your skill. That's the secret of success and is the key to being regarded honorably, unquote. So it's very, very clear that Jiro had his soul in the game based off of the definition that you just gave. Um, especially in regards to his job. 
And he's also thought deeply about why he loves what he does. So do you think it's possible to be a good investor without actually loving it? I think it's very difficult to do this in the long run. Because what's going to happen if you're doing it just for money, you're going to be competing against people who are doing it for the love of it. You know, who are doing it because they wake up in the morning and that's all they can think about. So you're going to be in a significant disadvantage in the long run if you're just doing it for money. And eventually, eventually you will lose that game because, you know, because there's a lot of people who are doing it as a hobby. I mean, in the hobby, they, they get paid for it. Like I do it, I get paid for it, but I would do the same thing if I didn't get paid for it because I love investing. So I remember reading that when George Soros was asked about when he first realized he was good at making money, he replied, quote, I don't like it. I'm just good at it, unquote. So do you think someone who thought about investing in that light and was successful had soul in the game? You know what's kind of interesting? I question George Soros' response a little bit, how honest it is, because he wrote like three or four different investment books. And he's a billionaire, and I can promise you you don't write books for money. I can, I can tell you this as an as a author of several books. So he probably loves it a lot more than he's willing to admit. Um, but I'm going to hedge my answer a little bit because if you look at, you know, they're probably around the same age as Buffett, more or less. Uh, and Buffett obviously loves what he's doing. At Soros, he basically stopped managing money professionally. He may still supervise it a little bit, uh, but he had other money managers, other other people run more, the bulk of his money. So he probably you know, so so maybe you know maybe that explains in part why he's no longer managing money. So you mentioned meditation in your book. And I think that I'm at a place that you mentioned you were at at one place where uh, I have this inability to not think while meditating and it probably drives me away from keeping on doing it when I probably should be doing it over and over again. But the benefits of meditation, such as you know being better able to manage stress, thinking more clearly and increasing self-awareness obviously has a huge impact on anyone's life, regardless of if you're an investor or not. So how would you suggest someone new to meditation get started? Yeah. Let me um, dispel kind of a few myths about the meditations first. Um, number one, I think one of the biggest myths is that because you meditate, you're going to be calmer. I think, like let's say you meditate for 20 minutes. I, I'm not sure how much benefit that 20 minutes in itself has. But it's, but it, it's, the, side effect, there is a, it's the other side effect that, that makes you calmer as a person. And I'll get to that side effect in a second. But you said something very interesting. You said you can, you cannot not think when you meditate. And I think this is the, the most. This is probably the primary reason why most people don't meditate, because they try meditate, they try not to think, and they fail. Well, and then when I say the word "fail" in quotes, that is the feature, not a bug. Like trying to sit and not to think is part of the meditation and you failing, that's a big part of it. Because what happens is this, when you fail, when you fail, and again, I use it in quote, in air quotes, when you fail, what you try to do, you try to observe the thought that on which you failed, okay? And this observation of thought makes you, actually trains you to be mindful, to observe your thoughts, to observe your emotions. The reason it's important because I think that's what gives you that that's what makes you a calmer person. Because what happens to us, we spend most of our time having this subconscious thought, always thinking about something, always worrying about something. And it's happening subconsciously, so we're not noticing it. Now, once you train yourself, you know, observe your thoughts, it's almost like a, imagine like you have a desktop computer and you know, this main main processor, and then you have another little computer that sits on its side desktop computer that analyzes what desktop computer is doing. And that's what meditation is. Can if you start observing your thoughts, and I'll give you an example. I was, I was driving somewhere a few years ago and I noticed that I'm very stressed about something and I 
And I started to think about it. I realized what I'm stressed about. And the second I realized what it was, it's almost like you poke a balloon with a needle. It's kind of, it, you, you pop this, you know, he pokes the story and goes away. And that's what made me calmer. So I think that is the kind of become mindful, be able to observe your own thoughts. And, and therefore, that pain that comes with incessant thinking about that, that, that gives you, that's what causes you pain. That's what uh, med- meditation uh, helps you to do with. Now, how do you start med- meditation? Well, first, you're trying to create a new habit. So when you try to create a new habit, what I suggest you do, try to remove all the obstacles. Make it as easy as possible. Make it something that's easy to repeat. So if you find a comfortable chair at home, link it to something. In other words, you can link it to something you do every day. You wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, maybe the next thing you meditate. Or you come after work, you put your cell phone away you know, on, the, on the counter, maybe the next thing you meditate. Link it to something you do every single day. Um, also, I think this is the case where you repeating it over and over again is more important than how long you meditate. If you start meditating three minutes a day and then gradually increasing, any, everybody, I can promise you this one. Let's say not three minutes, let's say one minute. Anybody can meditate for a minute. I can promise you, anybody. You can meditate for a minute, for sure. Uh, and you start with one minute and then you increase it to three to five to 10. And, and you do it every single day and you don't miss it. Um, there's, by the way, there's uh, so many, if you need uh, supplements, there's so many supplements out there. are so many apps out there. There's a, Sam Harris has an app, Waking Up. Uh, there was another app called Calm. Then YouTube has a lot of videos you can listen to, meditate to. Uh, the, the only thing what you're trying to do is like you are, like the basic meditation is you sit down, you breathe, you focus on your breath, and then just all you're trying to do is just focus on your breath and nothing else. And while you focus on your breath, those come to mind. Oh, I'm on a podcast. I should be probably focusing on the podcast, not on meditation. But anyway, you know, you, but anyway, so, but that's a, and then you observe this thought and you go back to breathing again. So I really like that point you made just about, you know, uh, attaching it to, to a habit of something you do every day. Cause it's funny. Like I, I, I think, I do think a lot, a lot, you know, but, I don't know if I'm necessarily focusing on my breathing. So like, you know, I, I guess in some sense I am meditating, but you know, like, can you meditate without focusing on your breathing in your opinion? Well, oh yeah, you can, you can, there's, there are many way, different ways. You can meditate by focusing on just listening to sounds. Just go, I say, try this, go to the park or go outside and sit outside on the bench and just start listening to sounds. First of all, I promise you, you're going to hear sounds. You didn't know, like you're going to hear highway three miles away. Like even that sound is always there. We just never pay attention to that. You know, you can, you can, there's a many different ways to do this. You can focus on breathing. You can focus on the subject, working at the subject. Some meditations are with your eyes open. Like they, I mean, I try to meditate, listen to classical music as well. There's a many different ways to, to meditate. You need to find whatever works for you. So I love the chapters in your book where you talk about the adventures that you've had with your children and the challenges of parenthood. So I'm a newish father myself as well. I have a 16 month old son. And um, it's clear to me, obviously from reading your book that you made being a good father a large part of your life and invested a large amount of time into doing just that. So what have been some of your biggest realizations about uh, improving your work-life balance that you've learned since being a father? You know, um, I struggle with this concept of work-life balance because it's a balance like when you think about the word balance it kind of assumes there is a it's a 50 50 there is some kind of you know um i think the way i look at it is that you want to mindfully look at your life and identify important elements in your life and i'm going to give you an example going through you know and then prioritize those things and knowing that like, if you think about it, a big part of life is just dealing with constraints. It's like economics. You think about it, what economics is, is just dealing with constraints. It's always uh, dealing with life. And the biggest constraint in life is time. Um, so the way I look at this, let me, let me just kind of, as an example, let me go through my life. The way I look at my life, 
Uh, I prioritize things like this. Myself, family, investor, writer, then CEO of IMA. You know, I'm separating, I'm writing, I can be an investor. I've seen being portfolio manager, a CIO of IMA, and being CEO of IMA, and then friendships. Okay? So you could argue that, well, friendships are not important to me. No, they are important to me. Don't get me wrong. But if you value everything the same, you value nothing. So you have to, this process of prioritization. And, and you want to make sure that every single thing there is that you don't run it into deficit. In other words, if I completely neglect my, neglect my friends, then I'm going to pay for that at some point in time. And it's horrible. And, I, and, I, and relations to me are important. So, but the reason I structured it this way, uh, the reason I put myself first is because, you know, when you're there on the airplane and they tell you in the case, in case of emergency, first put a face mask on yourself. Well, if I'm not, if I, if I don't get enough sleep, if I am, uh, if I don't eat well, if, uh, I, if I'm not in a good mental state, nothing else is going to matter. So I want to make sure that I exercise, I eat well, I, I get enough sleep. I, you know, in relationships, by the way, are part of it too. So it's a, I kind of take care of the relationships right there. Um, that's then my family. And, uh, and this is very important. They, your kids at some, your, your 16 year old son, at some point he'll be 22 and he'll tell you dad, uh, Cal, where do you live? In Vancouver. Vancouver. Okay. So he said, dad, I want to move to Washington DC. Okay. So, <laughs> and, and you'll be, Remembering the moments you had with yeah you know, with your son when he was two years old, five years old, fifteen years old. So I think, like, like when it comes to my kids, I, I'll be honest. I kind of approach from regret minimization perspective. I just want to make sure that I'm present and I'm there for them when they grow up, because at some point they will be, they'll grow up and they won't need me. And uh, so that's when my family comes in S second. Then investing for me, it's very important because, I mean, I make clients hire, you know, basically come to us and say, Vitaly, here's my life savings. Don't screw it up. So it's incredible responsibility. Plus, I love doing this, and that truly gives me meaning. So I, I do have soul in the game when it comes to investing. Then, you have, then I have writing. And writing to me, I would, you know, and writing and investing, like sometimes you – it's very difficult to draw the line between writing and investing because I write a lot about investing. And that's how I think. That is, if you think about writing, it's just basically focused thinking. For two hours a day, every morning I write, and that is my focused thinking time. Um, so, so writing is right there and then, you know, next to investing. And it's very important to me. And, and, and so and then, I have, then I've been CEO of IMA. Now, this is, this is a very important point. My company now at the point where I am not as much needed as much to run the company because I have a lot of people helping me. So when 10 years ago, when the company was much smaller, it, you know, it, you know, it was uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, its priority was higher where it is today. But now it's lower priority, just not because I don't care about the company. It's just because I have so many capable people helping me to do this. Free me, free up time for me to focus on uh, other things, and then and finally have friendships. And again, uh, I, when it comes to friendships, what I'm trying to do, I favor quality over quantity to have meaningful relationships. You can't. It, it's very difficult to have a lot of a lot of true friends, just because friendship requires investment of time. And so what I do, I have a handful, very close friends with whom I talk all the time. I go for a walk in the park and I call them, okay? And, but I know that there's a lot of, other, I have a lot of wonderful friends slash acquaintances, but I know just, there is just so much time and I can't have, I can't have a deep relationship with them. So I have a handful of friends and that's how kind of I manage my friendships. So my point is this, what I, what I just described to you is, prioritiz is prioritization of my life, okay? And that is going to be different 
and it's different. It was different for me at different points in life as well. I mean, before I had kids, obviously kids were not, you know, were not part of that. Uh, and studying was a big part of it. So, uh, but the key here is this. You want to kind of mindfully create categories and figure out how much time, what's more important to you. And then you look at your time. How do you spend your time? Because right. like attention is really a currency of time. How you spend your time is basically tells you exactly what your priorities are. So when I was researching you, I came across a great comment on stoicism and why it resonates with you so much. So you said, quote, when we were born, we were born with the same hardware and software. We all have similar hardware. And the software from an operating systems perspective is basically a blank slate, unquote. So your point was that, you know, your operating system is largely shaped by things like our own experiences, our parents' experiences, books we read, you know, things that happen in the world while we're alive. So I'm interested in knowing how stoicism fits into how you've upgraded your own operating system. Well, it provides an operating system, basically. <laughs> what stoic stoicism basically helped me to reduce the volatility of negative emotion, you know, a volatility of neg negative emotion in my life. It, it allowed me to, when I go through life, to remove, to remove stress from it. And, uh, and, and then, so now I look at life differently because of stoicism. So you discussed a few really, really good um, investing tools that you've learned from your studies in stoicism. And the first one I'd like to discuss is the dichotomy of control. So do you mind outlining um, that tool and how you've used it? That, that is the concept that got me into stoicism. That was like, a, it's so simple. And I'm going to tell you what it is. And you're like, what? So they say, that, that was it. They say, but it's so brilliant. And it basically says, some things are up to us, some things aren't. I mean, that's the part where you say, oh, what's up is that? Um, no, but then, uh, so let me just give you a little bit of context to Stoicism. So Stoicism, it's a 2,000-year-old philosophy that came from ancient Greece. Uh, and uh, there were basically three kind of main Stoics. Um, there was uh, Marcus Aurelius. He was an emperor of Rome, uh, the most powerful person in that universe at that time. Uh, there was uh, Seneca, who was kind of the Renaissance man, I don't know, seven or 10 centuries before Renaissance. Uh, and then there was Epictetus. And Epictetus was a slave who was freed, and then he became a, a, a Stoic teacher. So the concept, uh, the academy of control is a concept that came from Epictetus. So, and he says, some things are up to us, some things aren't, okay? But then he continues and he says, things that are up to us are our values, our decisions, how we react to things. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Everything else is not up to us. So, Kyle, you drive into work and you, you get a green light every single time. That's good. But another day you drive to work and it's a red light, okay? Well, you get a green light or red light is not up to you. But what's up to you is how you act to it, okay? So you go to grocery store and the caloric is rude to you. Well, there are a couple of things. There's, there's, we, can, we can double click on that. First of all, you have zero control how other people will treat you. And, and also sometimes you should, ask, you should ask yourself a question. Do I really expect to go through life and every single person I'm ever going to meet is going to be kind to me and nice to me? Probably not. So you should be prepared that there will be a time when people are not nice to you. And again, what you can control is how you respond to them being not kind. Also, and we can talk about this now, when somebody is not rude, is rude to you, it's a you just, I, what I just did, I just basically framed somebody saying words and I said they were rude, okay? Actually, I'll give you an interesting example. Um, it's a fascinating example. Um, I have a, we have some Israeli clients. And I, I don't know if you ever communicate with Isra Israelis. They're incredibly direct. Like it's a, they direct to the point that you think they're rude, but they are not. They're just being direct. So, 
it's a it's it's very interesting because it's like uh I tell my staff when they talk to you know to my coworkers when they talk to our Israeli clients they it's they're not being rude they're just being direct that's that's the that's what culturally they do so we really have a choice to frame anything we can put we can color it any way we want we can color it as people basically being direct to us or we can color it as they've been rude okay if you color it as they've been direct suddenly you don't have a negative reaction to it if you if you color it as they've been you know uh, as you frame it as they've been rude you you start interpreting them in rude and it has a negative reaction and you have a negative reaction so it's a that's kind of an interesting example. I'm sure the cultural differences, like a, a very interesting story. Let me just, I think it's just a wonderful story. So we have this client and uh, we, she's been a client for a long time and we have actually became very good friends. And, and uh, she's a, she, uh, we managed a significant sum of money for the family. And she sends me this email and she says, Vitaly, like, which never happens like this. This stock is too expensive. We need to sell this. This stock, the dividend is too low, we should sell it. This stock given this high, we should buy more of it. And this is like, I'm not a broker, I'm a money manager. So people usually give me money and say, well, people not usually always give me money and say, invest it for us. So I never get a treatment like this. And here's what I did. I basically wrote this two line email, basically says, they said, listen, I understand this is not your words. This is comes from your family, but you have a couple of options. Uh, I can do everything you want me to do, but then why am I charging you fees? And also, and also, if you want me to do those things, you probably don't need me. So we can just yeah, move on and terminate the relationship. So this was the first, uh, this was the first line. Um, and then what I did, I took this and put it into chat GPT and said, please make it very nice. And I said, dear, Dear Chris, I hope the sun is shining in your part of Israel. And it's basically what was two lines it became a, like half a page. And I sent her both versions. I said, here's an Israeli version. Here's an American, here's an American version. You decide. She laughed so hard about this. And she's like, I love the Israeli version so much more. But again, so the point I'm trying to make, you're going to meet people and what you think is rudeness sometimes just it's a different style of communication. And sometimes people just have a bad day. Like if you assume benevolence, your life is going to be so much easier because you realize we all have a, you know, you may be dealing with a person who just really had something bad happen to them. And, you know, they are reacting to you. is not really to you. It's really they're reacting to other things happening in their life. But by you taking it personally, what you're doing, you're making your life worse. So by you reframing it, what you just did, you remove unnecessary stress out of your life. It's funny because, you know, obviously in investing, the dichotomy of control is, is so powerful because there's so much stuff that is completely out of our control in the market. Well, let's double click on this. Let's, 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 because I think investing, yeah, that's, that's a perfect, uh, if you are an investor, you need to practice the dichotomy of control every single day. And that's what you do. Because what's up to me is my process. It's up to me is learning, trying to get better, having a, executing, a, you know, doing a good research, executing a good process. That's it. After I bought the stock, or when I own the stock, what happens to the war? Like, you know, there's so many, so many good things and bad things get, that, that can happen. None of those things are up to me. Okay, so now, and also the market will price my stocks. My market, in, in addition to this, has an opinion on every single stock I own in the portfolio about 5,000 times a day. Okay, again, that opinion is not up to me either. So realizing that what's up to me is also to re, you know, react, you know, doing research and reacting rationally. When, by the way, bad things will happen. And when bad things happen, me reacting rationally is up to me. Um, so, uh, that's, I think the academy of control is very, very important in investing. Yeah. So you wrote, uh, this really good Victor Frankl quote, which is between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space, our power to choose our response and in our response lies, our growth and our freedom, unquote. So 
this quote is a powerful introduction to the EJR framework, which is kind of along the lines of what you've already discussed. But the EJR framework, in your words, is stands for events, judgment, and reaction. So do you mind just going over this uh, framework in a little more detail and discuss how it's impacted you the most? Yeah, so the, if you think about Stoic philosophy, it's just really, there's a whole bunch of mental models that you can use interchangeably with each other. You can sometimes it's a multiple mental models you can be used at once. So event, judgment, reaction. So something happens. At this point, you have an opportunity to judge. Uh, like, like the, the, you know, you're driving, uh, driving to work and you have all the red lights. It's the events and you're judging it as just part of life. You know, you're kind of accepting it as a part of life. Um, somebody that's rooted you, you know, root a root at you. Now, first of all, you may choose to reframe it. The event, judgment, you can you know, now you can use a reframing as a framework. Therefore, once you reframe it, your reaction is going to be different. Um, so it's a basically, and this is where meditation comes in. That space between the event, judgment, and judgment, that's where mindfulness comes in. And you, this is when you, you and you you feel like okay, this is an opportunity where most likely I'm going to react negatively. You identify that, and then you change something. You can use negative visualization. Another concept. Uh, I'll give an example. You're driving. Your wife calls you up and says, "Kyle, I have this incredible turkey and gravy. Come home. We're going to have a bottle of wine in Turkey." And you're driving home, and you're stuck. There was a car accident, and you're stuck in two-hour traffic. And now you can you can frame it as I'm sitting in this uh, metal box. I this you know in the yeah and, and there is a turkey and gravy waiting for me and wine. And how horrible my life is. Or you can say I have an opportunity to sit in the car and to listen to wonderful podcasts. My guest Vitali has. Okay, so you can do that. Or and this this is where negative visualization comes in. You say, how many people, like I could have been driving home from the hospital where the doctor told me I have two weeks to leave. Or I could be living in Ukraine right now and being bombed by Russia or whatever. So you negative visualization often, a lot of times what it does creates this contrast that makes us appreciate what we have, which we take for granted because we get used to it. And a lot of times, I tell you, like uh, we went to Mexico a couple of years ago and we ordered, we, had, we were supposed to have this ocean view you know, room and we didn't get it. And I, I literally was going through this and I was like telling my wife, you know what? <laughs> we get to spend a vacation in Mexico. It's, it's, nothing could be that bad. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not so bad. Um, so like this negative visualization, what it allows you to do, it's, uh, you, you start looking at your situation and realize it's not so bad because it could be so much worse. And suddenly, what you just did, if you think about it, a lot of times what we're trying to do, we're trying to trick ourselves to basically kind of to remove stress out of unnecessary stress out of life. And this is what stoicism helps you, just gives you all these different tools, frameworks to remove that unnecessary stress. So I just wanted to touch a little bit more on negative visualization because it's a tool that I've used for a long time and I think it's really powerful. So, because, and I really like the way you've, molded kind of everything in together with the the human operating system, right? Because if we don't use negative visualization, then, you know, these events happen, we make our judgments, and then we just kind of react kind of not really with much thought, which usually tend to be we overreact and we react in a negative way. But, you know, obviously, if we use negative visualization over a long period of time and become aware of of our reactions, it kind of, it becomes imbued into that operating system. And we're able to just do it more naturally. Is that kind of how you've, you viewed it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. Every day before I write, I, I, I get a cup of coffee, but before I get a cup of coffee, I linked push-ups to the, uh, to the cup of coffee. Uh, and uh, when I do these push-ups, and I'm not a big fan of working out in general, I'm not a big fan of doing push-ups, but I tell myself I'm so lucky that I can actually do these push-ups. There will be time when I won't be able to. Just think about it. So now I actually, I appreciate that I get to do push-ups. 
you can use negative visualization this way. We already talked about your kids growing up. If you realize how scarce your time is with your kids, it's you're going to appreciate that time more. And I used to, this is a true story. I used to, dread is not the right word, but I used to look at driving my kids to school as a chore. As a, like I put it, I used to put it in the same category as taking out trash. <laughs> it sounds horrible, but it's like I love taking out trash as much as I loved before I go to work, you know, putting two kids in the car and hear the yelling, yelling and screaming and driving to school. And then when I realized that my time is so finite, after your kids go to college, you spend probably 90% or 95% of your time with them. Okay? So and once I realized how finite it is, actually now I volunteer to drive my kids to school. Now I want to drive my kids to school. It's the, what, what the irony of this is the action is the same. I'm driving my kids to school, but I changed, I reframed how I look at it. And see again, it's a reframing and negative visualization together. Let's look at this more in an investing light. So how would you use negative visualization in you know, your day-to-day -day investing and how does it help you uh, think better and, and react uh, more rationally? I think the... It's a kind of, when you look at, when you buy, before you buy a stock, you kind of visualize it's been down 50% and been fine with that. By the way, same thing with your portfolio, because at some point it will be. Okay. Like it's a, again, like I love this phrase. Like, do you really expect to go through life as an investor and not see your portfolio decline by 20, 30, 50%? And if you do, then you should not be an investor. You should not be investing. You should be, you know, you should buy money market funds or bonds or whatever. You should not be in stocks. Um, so that kind of phrasing, do you really expect to? And that's and then you, you know, and I, you know, I, I do it all the time. What if in 2024, you got a little bit better every day? When you're learning a new language with Babbel, that's exactly what you're doing. And if Babbel can help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks, Imagine what you could do in a full year. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. Thanks to Babbel, I can start having conversations and order my food in Spanish at local restaurants when the situation allows. It's no wonder they've sold over 10 million subscriptions and that studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove that Babbel is better. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash WSB. Get 55% off at babbel.com slash WSB. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash W-S-B. Rules and restrictions may apply. So the lasso tool that I want to talk about, which you've already discussed, um, is reframing. So there's just a cool, a couple cool things I want to add. Just there was a really good Epictetus quote that you had in your book, which is, quote, it is our attitude towards events, not events themselves, which we can control. Nothing by its own nature is calamitous, unquote. And then you had this really good example of taking cold showers, which I know you do. And, and uh, you talked about basically how, you know, the cold shower itself is not particularly enjoyable, right? But it's our kind of our fear of, of how we're going to react and feel towards that cold shower. And you've kind of reframed that into a different way of looking at it. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah. So, okay. I think when we call stoic philosophy a philosophy, I think it's we're doing a little bit of disservice to it. That's called stoic practice. And the reason it's practice is because it's a muscle you need to train. Okay, the just like you need to train yourself to meditate, and and by doing this, you're gonna start start observing your own thoughts. Um same way you're gonna the more the the more you use these tools, the better you're gonna become as these tools. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a constant, never-ending practice. Okay, and 
cold shower is the kind of it's a basically if uh, um so like when you go to the store and the and the and the and the caloric is not rude to you you don't get to practice stoicism unfortunately however you can create this kind of practice every day of stoicism when you do cold shower because basically like there's a lot of studies that tell you that taking cold shower is good for you but that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about turning a cold shower and actually st- like it's almost like you break it up into uh, two parts. You you look at the shower. I mean, actually, three parts. Before you get into shower, being in, uh, you know during the shower and after the shower, uh, after the cold shower. So it's the, what the part I'm talking about is you standing right before the cold shower and you get it in, and you really don't want to. And then you start asking yourself, so what's the worst thing that's going to happen to me? And you start you start you start you, start, you know, start thinking about this. Like you start preparing yourself that you have, um, like if you think about life, a lot, a lot of things that we have to do in life, you don't want to do them. But a lot of times you over dramatize them in our head, in our heads, how horrible they are. And once we go through that, it's not, it's not such a big deal. By the way, that relates to stock market all the time. The stock market loves it, hates its uncertainty. And a lot of time you can take advantage of that because they are afraid what's going to happen in the next six months. Well, you know what happens in the next six months? There is another forever. So if you, get, if you can live through the next six months and the company doesn't die, you may have an opportunity, right? So uh, it's a, this cold shower is basically, I look at it as an exercise of basically kind of pra- practicing, like identifying my thoughts, like my fear, and conquering it. Every single day, and I'm sure, yeah, and I'm sure there are a whole bunch of other health, other health benefits, but that's unrelated to stoicism. So I know that you're in uh, Colorado, which definitely isn't a hotbed of investing like other states, such as New York. So I'm interested in learning more about some of the hidden advantages that you've noticed from living in Colorado compared to a very noisy city such as New York. You know what's interesting? Um, I ended up in Colorado. Not because I wanted to be like Warren Buffett. I was just—it was a lack of a draw. I when we came from uh, when my my aunt who left Moscow uh, left Moscow in 1979 and moved to Brooklyn. Uh, she married a rabbi, and they moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming. So when she invited us to come over to the United States, luckily she invited us to Denver. It's 100 miles you know, away. So that's how I ended up in Denver. And so initially. And you know, living in Denver was not a choice. Yeah, you know, I didn't make the choice. My aunt made it for us. But then later in life, I actually made deliberately made the choice. I would go to New York, and I love. By the way, I love going to New York. I love going to Manhattan. I love the energy. I love the culture. I love going to restaurants. I love going to theaters, museums, Central Park, walking the streets. I love it. The only problem is I also love coming back. Okay, three days is plenty for me. I mean, I come back, I'm completely drained and exhausted. Now, but there is something else there too. If you are in the finance industry and you live in New York, you are basically, you, you get plugged in into this rat race. Everybody compares, like there was a spec and order comparison all the time. How far you live, do you live on the east, east side of the park, Central Park or west side? Does your apartment have, uh, does your, has a balcony? How far is it, you know, what floor does it have a doorman? Okay, so it's a oh, and by the way, do your kids go to private school? Which private school? So it's always what happens. Again, again, I'm generalizing, but if you're not careful, that rat race, that environment is so toxic that suddenly you start living by somebody else's values, which I would argue is not a good way to have a, you know, it's not, okay, at least I'm speaking for myself. That's not a life I want to have. I mean, again, there's a lot of, it. it's possible to live in New York and not experience that, but I think it's the uphill battle. So living in Denver, I don't, I don't, I like, I don't experience that. I live in this little micro bubble where I go to the park, I drive my kids to school. I don't experience the social pressure. And I love that. And I think it allows me to have a longer time horizon. And I think it allows me also not be 
as focused on material things. Again, I, I know it's like an investment guy writing a book about stoicism and life and then telling you how important material things are. You know, I'm not living on the street and eating banana. You know, that's not, you know, that's not the point. But my point is, it's not a, it's not the material things do not dominate my life. I mean, they're still important, but don't get me wrong, but then they don't dominate my life. And so I think that that's a huge advantage of living in Denver. So I still have a lot of friends, investment friends whom I talk to all the time. So we share stock ideas, et cetera. And they could be New York and London or Zurich for that matter. But uh, I feel like today you don't have to live in New York anymore. And I think that's kind of Buffett, I think at some point identified him living in Omaha, being far away from everybody else, allowed him to, it's almost like you have your own internal clock and your, uh, and your clock is not set by the environment. And I think when in New York, if you're not careful, that's what happens to you. That could happen to you, yeah. So you wrote, quote, by making small but conscious decisions about the environment around us, we can influence our creative output and our ability to make good decisions. We have to be extraordinarily careful to choose the right environment, to work with and even socialize with the right people, unquote. So you had a wonderful example of how you use this to stay healthier by not eating desserts when you're in the state of Denver. Um, But I'm interested in understanding more about how you've crafted your work environment to optimize your investing. Um, Okay, I'll give a couple examples. Um, Number one, I, okay. Number one, I find that my most productive time is before 2 p.m., my time. So I, I rarely, if ever, have any appointments before one o'clock. The, from five to seven, roughly, I write. That's my writing time. And from eight to one or two, this is the time I focus on investing. Every day I go for a walk in the park. And I would argue, and to me, it's almost like a religious experience because I find it incredibly important for creativity. Because... It's a, if you think of, like, if you look around you, you know, right now, every single object around you is, is, has a symmetrical form. Everything from this phone to the screen to everything is symmetrical. When, and therefore, it's, a, it's almost like your, the electrons in your brain kind of move in a symmetrical form, you know, in a parallel form. When you go outside and you are around trees, there is nothing symmetrical about trees. And so suddenly your thoughts start to interact with each other slightly differently. So I find going outside is very important for my creativity. And by the way, I would argue investing is a creative endeavor. Um, so, so I don't, you know, so I usually have phone calls after two o'clock. Any, any, any tasks that are not creative, I usually push it after one or two o'clock. In addition to this, right now we're sitting in my office where there's a two big monitors. I have another office next door, which basically has an armchair, a giant iPad, headphones, a nice blanket, and my father's art around me. And this is where I go and I read. That iPad basically is connected to internet, but it doesn't have any communication software in it. So I just download 10Ks, transcripts, whatever magazines I want to read, and that's where, you know, that's where I read. So that is because I find that what you want to do, you don't want to fight your environment. You want to be environment to be your friend. Because, and uh, so you use as little willpower as possible. So if I'm sitting, imagine this. Let's say, let's, let's say you don't look like you need to lose weight, but let's say you decided you want to quit sugar. And then what you did, you put apple pie, donuts, Mars candy, right next to you and said, yeah, I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying not to eat sugar. That's going to be like, you're basically, it's very exhausting because how much energy is going to consume you, willpower is going to consume you not to reach for the donut or for the Mars bar, whatever, right? So you want the environment to be, uh, to be your friend, not your enemy. Let me give you another example. I change my diet it's actually now my lifestyle where now I don't eat any, I basically eat meat and vegetables. Okay. So we have a, a the, I'm a benevolent dictator at my global headquarters. So 
the company actually, we are not Google, but the company basically buys groceries for the office. So, but there's a condition. We can buy high quality protein, high quality vegetables and fruits. No processed food is allowed in the office. Okay, because again, I want the environment to be my friend. Okay, and therefore I've been eating very healthy for the last six months. Like, you know, when, once we instituted that. So I try to do these things to kind of, uh, I try to kind of mold the environment to be my friend, knowing my weaknesses. Yeah, that's excellent. I love, I love what you did at work there too. I mean, obviously you're the CEO, right? So you get to make all the big choices. So, but yeah, I mean, and work is funny because just coming from a, a health standpoint, you know, so many times you go to work and your co colleagues are bringing donuts and, and coffee or whatever. And like you said, right? I mean, if you're trying to eat healthy, you're trying not to eat sugar and you're surrounded by all this stuff all the time. Well, that's pretty hard. So I, I like, I really like that, that, uh, that thing that you instituted at your work. Um, and the next thing I wanted to go over was your formula for happiness that you actually talked about in your book, which was basically to take things that you enjoy the most and divide them by the things that you don't enjoy. And then the goal is to make that number higher by hopefully maximizing the numerator and minimizing the denominator. So I'm interested in knowing the best strategies that you've come across to minimize the denominator, both in, in life and also in, uh, from an investing lens. We went through prioritization right. of my life, right? So I should be spending most of my time at work basically on investing. But other things come in. Like, like uh, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So I write articles. And then what we do, we have a podcast where basically that article is turned into kind of an outer form, like an outer book. So you, if you don't have time to read my articles, you can listen to them. At some point in time, we had to make a choice who is going to read those articles. I realized that I enjoy, first of all, I enjoy writing those articles. I don't enjoy reading them. Also, reading them would consume another 30 to 50 minutes per article. So, so what we decided to do, we just hired somebody who would read those articles out loud to my listeners. So what I did, I basically realized, okay, number one, I love writing. And I can add this way add value. Somebody else, somebody else can do my, probably much better job reading than I can. And if I take this 15 minutes, and if I do this, it means I'll have less time doing something else. Either spending time with my friends, doing research, whatever. So I started to delegate things a lot more. So if I, if I don't, you know, if it's basically two categories, I add a lot of value. I enjoy it. Okay. Um, like, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple more examples. Uh, when it comes, like in the past, I remember 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, when I would try to have an appointment, like to schedule a call or an appointment or dinner with my friends, uh, some of them would have their you know, secretary, uh, their assistant, not secretary, assistant would do those, you know, would schedule those uh, appointments. And I, I felt like my friends were trying just to show how successful they are and uh, by doing this. And now I realize I was completely wrong. What they basically realized that the time they spent on scheduling when, you know, the uh, appointments, etc., they add very little value. Okay. And, and, and over time, the time adds up. So by delegating this task to somebody else, they will actually, uh, they will, it's actually like buying time basically. Um, and there is another kind of interesting dilemma here because you almost like the, I used to, I used to have this feeling like, I, I don't like feeling like I'm superior to somebody else. Okay. So when you ask, when I ask my assistant to do something, I don't, I, I don't like the kind of the, the feeling I, I get, I used to not like the feeling I get that I'm asking to do, do, do things for me. But then I read this book. Uh, there's this wonderful book, completely unrelated to investing, called Shantaram. And it's, a, it's incredible. By the way, I highly suggest the book. Uh, it's about India. And uh, there was this, this, it's about this Australian going to India in the 1980s. And he tells this wonderful story. He lived in Mumbai, 
and he lived on the third or fourth floor. And this was very, very hot and muggy. So he would take a shower three times a day. And one day he's walking down and see a guy carrying buckets of water. He's like, why are you carrying buckets of water? He's like, well, sir, you're taking a shower? That's, you know, there's no pump, so that's the water to be used for you to take a shower. And the guy says, oh my God, I'm taking three showers a day and you have to do this. I feel so horrible. Like, I'm going to start taking one shower a day. He's like, and the guy says, no, no, sir, please take five showers a day. Because, because if you're taking showers, I have the job. Okay, my point is this. You have, like, you have an assist, like, by me having, having a need to have somebody schedule appointments, I created the job. By me not doing recording podcasts myself, I created the job. So once you start looking this way, you realize you're actually, you actually doing a good thing. Like I'm creating, I'm, I'm doing, spending more time doing things where I have the most value and I'm creating jobs for people that wouldn't have other jobs otherwise. So anyway, so this is, I, I thought that's reframing. It's kind of very liberating. That's an excellent example. So the next thing I wanted to go over was um, the four modes of communication that you discuss in your book, which was preacher, prosecutor, politician, and scientist. So can you briefly discuss each of these modes and go into detail about scientist mode and why it's so important to spend time in that mode to foster the learning process? I think so. I got to give uh, credit for this to Adam Grant, who borrowed it from another of his, I forget the guy's name, from another colleague uh, of his. Um, yeah, so you have this, uh, the preacher mode. So we all, so basically, we all at different times use these modes, okay? When uh, a preacher, imagine somebody like a preacher, you know, in, in the church, right? He has his idea and he's basically wants to communicate this and he wants everybody to, to kind of to buy into whatever he's selling, like his, his ideas, right? It's a one way of communicating. It's a kind of, it's going out, communication going out. Then you have a prosecutor and prosecutor is basically a person who is trying to change your mind, right? Uh, doesn't really care about the truth. The whole point is there is just to change somebody's mind. Then you have a politician mode. And, if I, and I argue that politician mode is where we spend a lot more time than we realize. When you go on a date, you're in a politician mode. Because what you're trying to do, you're trying to get somebody to like you. So when the person says something you don't fully agree with, you kind of miss, you know, you kind of brush the side, don't focus on this. You try to omit the negatives, right? Because you're trying to get somebody to like you. A politician tries to get other people to like me to, to get reelected. We do this when we look for jobs, when we, uh, uh, when we go on dates. So we spend a lot of, but we spend a lot of times in, in those moments, and they're important. However, if you spend a lot of time, like most of your life, in these modes, you are not going to progress as a human being. You will not learn much because none of these modes are. You are not learning in those modes. In those modes, for the most part, you just. Um, you are, it's the outward communication mode. Now, the scientist mode is the mode where investors especially should spend most of the time. Uh, Seneca has this wonderful quote that I need to frame. Time discovers truth. And if you think about it, again, time discovers truth. If you think about investing, that's what investing is. You, you just, like when I, when I make an investment decision, I'm trying to discover truth before time does. So when I discuss ideas with other investors, I want to be in a scientist mode. What it means is that anything we discuss is a theory. And, and if it's a theory, it's moldable. If it's a theory, then you also, again, if you're trying to discover truth, you basically want to say, here are the assumptions I'm making. I'm, I'm assuming this, 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 and this. And, and you know, when I debate invest stocks with my friends all the time, they say, well, let's debate this assumption. Now let's figure out this assumption. And suddenly, you are just, you, it's, it changes the way you look at it because you start looking for the truth. And uh, as an investor, you want to spend a lot more time in that mode. 
Also, there's a, another very, very important thought here is that a lot of times our beliefs are formed completely randomly. Okay? Um, there is this, uh, there's this Hebrew word, abracadabra. And that word means I create as I speak. So as you start saying things, you start believing them. So if I ask you something and there's something like you, something you haven't thought about before, and the first thing that comes to mind, if I start, you know, you, you say, this is what I think, I be, what I believe, and I start debating you, even though you haven't had a chance to think it through yet, but because you and I started debating it, if you are not in scientist mode, if you are not uh, one of those three other modes, esp uh, then especially in the prosecutor mode, then that idea gets calcified and becomes part of your identity. So you should be very careful. Uh, you should a lot of ideas in your head should be really be theories, and you should be very very careful what becomes your identity. Like for me, a part of my identity is being kind. Okay, okay, but when it comes to politics and many other things, whatever, that's not part of my identity because I'm willing to change my mind. If you know, I'm you know, willing to change my mind, and so it's very important to examine how your beliefs are formed to re-examine your beliefs. So I really liked that, uh, that part there about you talking about how beliefs are formed. And, you know, I agree. Mo most people probably don't spend nearly enough time in, in science mode. So my question is, how can we, I mean, I guess this kind of probably um, builds in with your thing on uh, your emphasis on meditation and, and, you know, kind of knowing yourself and having that self-awareness, but how can we kind of know when, you know, maybe we should be in scientist mode, but we're not, or, or, you know, how can we be, make ourselves as self-aware as possible for, to know which mode we're in so that we can hopefully try to allocate more time to, you know, growth and thinking and being in scientist mode. Well, okay. Let me, let's, let's go through some examples. You get pulled over by a policeman, probably don't want to be in the scientist mode. Okay. <laughs> so there, there is a time, there is a time for every mode, but I think it's a, if you are trying to get your employees riled up to achieve something, again, scientist mode is probably not the right mode. In fact, like Steve Jobs was famous for his, I would, uh, would be, uh, would be preacher mode, right? Like his, uh, distortion reality field, distortion reality field, right? That was not a scientist mode. However, at the same time, like at the same time, when, when, Somebody he wanted, you know, Steve Jobs really wanted to make an iPad originally. And when they created the first iPad for him, he looked at it and said, "Perfect, let's go make an iPhone." Okay, and because he realized it's a much bigger product than iPad, and he could see what iPhone is going to look like. So I think as an investor, when you're doing research, that is a scientist mode behavior. When you're learning something new. Like when you're learning something and you should spend a lot of time as a human being learning a lot, um, then you should be in a scientist mode. If you are trying to get a girl to like you, probably, you know, the <laughs> politician mode here is more appropriate. Um, so it's a, but I think whenever it comes to learning, whenever you have debates, and especially like if, it, if okay, this is very important. I would argue you want to spend as little time as possible in the prosecutorial debates. If, if in other words, if if at the end of the, if uh, if at the end of debate nobody the, there is zero possibility that any any party is going to change their mind, probably should not have this conversation because it's a waste of time. So this is why I avoid talking politics because people were their their opinion, their thoughts. Uh, People thoughts already get calcified, and they won't change the mind. So there is no, w w what's the point of having, uh, what's the point of having this um, debate if you're not gonna learn anything? They're not gonna, they're not gonna learn anything. So there is no point in this. But I think it just if you look at your life and just ask yourself how much time I spend in each in, in each uh, 
in the mode of communication. If you spend a lot of time in the on the three P modes, unless you are a lawyer, like you know, then if you're a lawyer and you're in a court all the time, you probably should be spending more time in the prosecutor mode. <laughs> but if you're if you're doing research, you spend you should be spending most of your time in the not a prosecutor mode, but uh, in the uh, in the scientist mode. Let me give you one more example. I have a friend um, who is a very very famous short seller, Jim Chanos. And um, what's fascinating about Jim Chanos is that this is a person who seeks out the other. You know, he wants to understand the other side. He wants, to, he, yeah, because as a short seller, you there's always a, you know there's you are in minority, almost by definition. He always wants to understand what the other side argument is, and he usually can can state the other side argument better than the other side. Um, and um, I found on a, on a different, we, we, there was several times where we were on opposite sides uh, of a stock. He was short, I was long. And I found it to be fascinating because how like unemotional, fact-based our discussion was. And I also know other short sellers who Look at anybody who loans the stock as a as a mortal enemy, and uh, and that not not Jim Chanos, and, and and I think I respect him a lot for that, uh, because he's in a scientist mode because he's just trying to make money. He's just trying to make money for his clients. You know, it's not a, it's, it's 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 you know it's it's you know he you know he just you know he just wants to be right. You know you know he wants to discover truth before time does. That's it. So I really enjoyed how you broke down your writing process, especially as it pertains to metaphors to help you better communicate with your readers. So I'm interested in knowing how you utilize your extensive background in writing to help you create narratives for your investments that you're, that you're obviously researching. If you think about a lot about, if, if I think about my writing, what I try to do is storytelling. If you think about storytelling, it's probably the least efficient way to communicate. And what I mean by this, if you, if you, if KPI for efficiency number of words you use, because you can probably say everything I say in a paragraph. What takes me a page to say a page or two to you know to tell through a story, you can sum it up in a in a, in a sentence. But the the problem, the thing is, we as human beings need stories. This is how basically we go through life through stories. That's how we experience life through stories. So the finance could be very dry and boring. And to get people to explain like the like so like uh, let me give an example. So three or four times right three or four times a year I write letters to my clients. A lot of my clients are just very smart professional people who are not investors. Okay, so I need to communicate to them why, like how I look, how I analyze a company, you know, how I look, construct portfolio, and I need to do it in a way that doesn't put them to sleep. Because I write, like I literally write thirty-page letters, and I want them to read that. So I want, so therefore, I need to. I know that. It may take him more than a day to read it, and it may, may maybe take a few bottles of wine, which is fine. But I want him to finish it, so therefore I need to tell them through stories, and so they can something that's complex. It's going to be easier for them to relate to. So I think the storytelling are very powerful. Also, I think the Charlie Munger was very big on mental models. And mental models, to some to some degree, kind of a form of storytelling in the sense that you can you can port uh, one framework from like the bit of mental models. You can port one framework from one discipline to another, right? And so, so I think the story and mental models, combining mental models and storytelling, is a very important technique because I I just like I guess I I, I actually it's such a great question because I didn't even realize it until now. I guess. I was telling stories because I just wanted people to read my boring content, and I just didn't want it to be boring. I guess that's 
that's how that's how I became a storyteller. I didn't even realize it until now. Uh, but yes, but I think it's an incredibly important tool. And uh, I, a lot of times I know what I want to say when I sit down to write, but I don't know. But it's a, I spend most of my, my time discovering how to say it, what analogy to use, uh, metaphor, whatever. Um, and I think this is where I spend, you know, probably the most most of my time. And but also a lot of times, and if you talk to almost anybody who writes, what they sit down to write, like and what they end up finishing writing looks very different. Because a lot of times you start writing, you start discovering new things as as you're writing and and new concepts. So and this is part of the reason why I love writing, because it's again it's a focused thinking. It's a I think as I write. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a very cute word in it, Aramaic or something, like like abracadabra, like word. But, <laughs> but I think as I write. Um, and uh, so writing is probably one of the most important things that has happened to me as an, as, an, as an adult. Because think about it, I write two hours a day almost every single day. And that's like 700 hours a year. Let's say 700 hours of focused thinking. So that is a significant competitive advantage. I, when people ask me what advice would you give to a young, you know, young person, like I would say, number one, write. Just write every single day. And again, we can go through the same kind of uh, exercise if you want to meditation. Find the time that works for you. I'm a morning person. I write in the morning. If you are, uh, Walter Isaacson, you know, writes at night. So he's a night person. Great. Just link it to something you do every day and write every day. It doesn't matter how much you write. Just start writing. And then over time, this is what writing is so powerful because what happens when if you write long enough, you, it's, you, you develop what I call writer's brain. Uh, a writer's brain has a kind of a mind of its own. I like this the mixture of all these different analogies. But basically what happens when you start writing all the time, with the writer's brain, you start constantly looking for stories, for ideas. And you're going you're gonna to look at life differently than other people because you're gonna constantly looking out for those things. Something that goes unnoticed by others, I notice because, again, I'm looking for ideas. Um, the, a friend of mine asked me, like, how can I write so much? Because I write probably maybe 40 articles a year. And I said, on January 1st, I, have, like, I don't have 40 articles. I don't have 40 essays. But as life happens, I get ideas because I constantly look for them. I get ideas. And I ended up writing 40. Like When I started writing, I was so concerned I was going to run out of ideas. I, I was paranoid about this. Um, so it's a, this writer's brain is extremely powerful because I think it just changes how the way you look at life, period. Excellent. Yeah. So last question I wanted to discuss was, uh, a little bit about your other book, which I, I read and I really enjoyed, but we didn't get to talk about, which was the little book of sideways markets. So it was published back in 2011 and obviously a lot has happened since then. I'm interested in knowing how you've viewed the markets since the book was published. Well, so the it's kind of interesting. The I think the in the book I discuss I I discussed the framework, and I was very direct about this. That the one thing like the framework was based. The framework is very simple. Whenever the markets have become very very expensive, they usually the markets that follow are not kind of bear markets. Kind of the markets that decline for a long period of time, but are kind of a sideways markets where basically. You have a lot of volatility in the markets, but the slope of them is flat. And and so the what during that flatness, what's happening is just price earnings is declining while earnings are growing. So if earning, price earnings was twenty five, uh, earnings you know as earnings have you know have increased and prices haven't changed, the price earnings goes you know goes down to eight or nine times earnings. The everybody who you know, love to own stocks where they were 25 times earnings. And now that nine, they say, I will never own stocks ever again. And that's how next bull market started, starts. It's, that's it. I just, that's, I just, 
I just described the whole book in 30 seconds. However, so what's interesting about this, after I wrote the book, I never expected the interest rates decline to zero or in some countries to negative levels. And that changed the dynamics because price earnings declined and then they just went up because interest rates were so low, the stocks became a lot more attractive than zero or almost negative interest rates. And I think we're at the point today when probably my book is a better, is more appropriate than even than when I wrote it because the market is expensive. And But there is an interesting if here. The Since I wrote the book, the corporate profit margins have increased tremendously. We are at the highest level today than we were in, in the kind of in the corporate history. Uh, and therefore, profit margins historically would mean, 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 mean reversion. So they were high, they declined. Now, you have, in the past, you had a couple things going for corporations that benefited uh, profit margins. Number one, we had very low interest rates. And number two, outsourcing. Uh, the, we basically, we shifted a lot of our industrial capacity out of the United States to, uh, to other countries. Now, as we bring, as we bring this industry, you know, the world is a lot less friendly, friendly place than it was three, five, ten years ago. And therefore, we'll be uh, uh, bringing a lot more industrial capacity to the United States or to, or to our friends. And therefore, I would argue, most likely we be benefited from outsourcing. Now we're going to be insourcing. And that's going to be, that's going to put pressure on corporate margins. So I'd argue this book is actually more, uh, more, rele more relevant today than it was in 2011. Uh, Appreciate those insights. Vitaly, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can the audience learn more about you, your fund, and your books? So I'll just, I'll give you one link. And there you can read my articles, listen to my podcast, and it's very simple. Investor.fm. Like, like a film radio, investor.fm. You can read my articles, sign up for my newsletters, which are absolutely free. And you get to really learn about classical music, art, different things. And you can listen to my podcast, which is going to be read to you, not by me. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask, what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. Link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. There was a lovely study done by McDonald's that showed for one week, every family that came in to the McDonald's location received a balloon for each of the kids. Half of them got the balloon as they were leaving as a gracious thank you for frequenting our, our restaurant, right? The other half got the balloons as they came in. They got the balloons first. Those parents bought 25% more food. 